Good morning. It is a glorious day to have church. It is a have beautiful weather outside. It's a beautiful day. Welcome to Salem Baptist Church online. I'm Brother Abram Edwards. I'm the youth pastor here at Salem. And man, it is good to be here. I wish you could be here. But you know what? Props to you for those of you taking us outside into the weather, listening to us, singing with us, worshiping with us. Uh, it's going to be a great day. Uh, I don't really have any announcements. There's not a whole lot of announcements to give during this time, other than just to continue to be in prayer uh, with our leadership for our government, our nation. I know I keep mentioning this, but it's it's very important. Also, the leadership here at church, and just as the, we seek the direction of the Lord as we uh, look to open back up and to make decisions for your safety and to honor and praise God in, in all that we do. Uh, today's scripture that I have for you is in 1 Samuel 16, it's verse 7, and this is where uh, Samuel it has come to the, the family of Jesse, and he is uh, looking for the next king of Israel, because after the, the things that Saul had done, uh, the Lord had, had left him, had rejected him in his kingship, so he was looking for another, as you many of you may know, uh, we're talking about King David. And this is right after the, the one son of Jesse, uh, Eliab, had walked by, and he was a tall man, he was a strong man, he was a good-looking man, and in, in Samuel's heart, he, he says, surely this must be the one, Lord. In verse 7 it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And of course, we know after a few sons, we, we come to David, and you may know that story. If not, I'd love for you to encourage you to, to look at that. And I just want to encourage you today that, and maybe it's a challenge to you that the Lord doesn't see from the outside. He, he goes straight inside you to your heart, to your deep to the deep and depth of your soul and you may have a you know superficial outside you may be putting on a show uh, for different people you know whoever you come into contact with but the Lord knows your heart the Lord knows how you feel about people about certain situations about different ideas and what's going on and, and I want to encourage you now but I also want to challenge you in that that the Lord knows your heart the Lord knows if you haven't accepted him the Lord knows if you're one of his children. So I want to encourage you that if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today, that you would just open your heart to this message today, to the songs that we sing today. Just open your heart to it. I'm sure you're going to find God's message in it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you virtually online here, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. We would gladly be outside if it wasn't for the, the technology that we needed here inside the building, but we know that you are all around us here inside as well as outside. Lord, it's a beautiful day to worship you. We give you honor and glory. You are welcome here. You're welcome in the homes of our congregation, uh, your body of believers, Lord. And Lord, we're so glad just to lift you up today. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Kevin. All right. Thank you, Brother Abram. I love Brother Abram's haircut. Amen. Love it. Love it. Well, good morning, Salem and visitors. We're glad to have you this morning here joining us this morning. And uh, like Brother Abram said, it's a beautiful day. Uh -uh. So our first hymn we're going to sing is, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been sought Since Jesus came into my heart I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Let's enjoy so let the sea pillars roll since Jesus 
came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscured since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, not the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. There's a light in the valley of death now for me since Jesus came into my heart in the gates of that city beyond I can see since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart Bloods of joy, oh my soul, let the sea pillars roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart. came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart let of joy oh my soul let the sea pillars roll since Jesus came into my heart amen hey turn to the person next to you on the couch or chair or whatever and tell them you're good glad to see them this morning <laughs> glad to see y'all this morning <laughs> Hey, our next hymn this morning, we're going to sing Footsteps of Jesus. Footsteps of Jesus. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints us to thee. Prince of Jesus that made the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Steps of Jesus. 
Jesus in at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway go. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Amen. Um, this morning, I uh, asked the church, please pray, be praying for my Aunt Doris. Uh, <clears throat> she's at home. She's uh, with hospice care right now. You know, I've been blessed with a good mother, but also been blessed with a, a second mother. Doris has been like a second mother to me and my sisters, and uh, uh, had had a lot of good women in my life helped raise me, and uh, I've been very, very blessed. And uh, you know, she lost her husband at a young age with two young boys, little boys. Uh, first thing she did, she put God above all. And uh, so this morning, I like to sing uh, "Above, Above All." Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. You 
took the fall and thought of me above all. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for putting us above all, Lord, and using on that cross, Lord. And the third day after you rose, Lord, you served us, Lord, we got eternity with you in heaven forever. We love you, and thank you so much for for that price you pay. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, amen. It is good to be here once again with you today. Thank you for tuning in online. Uh, we appreciate everyone and your patience through this time. I want to ask you to continue to pray for uh, uh, me and our deacons. We meet today and we'll be discussing... Um, we've had a plan we've been working on over the last few weeks and been thinking through and praying through a plan for our reopening time. We know that uh, some other churches have uh, regathered together using social distancing. Some churches have done that today. Others will be doing that over the uh, uh, next few weeks. Uh, you'll be hearing of that. Each church is different. Each community is different. And so each church has to work out uh, their details and and feel comfortable definitely want to be safe and that's what we're looking to do here at salem baptist church we're looking to meet as soon as we can but we want to be as safe as we can uh, that's what's going to be uh, driving our discussion we meet again today and uh, if you're a regular attendee here at salem baptist church uh, as we do make a plan as we do have a date that we're going to come back uh, you're going to get if you're a regular attendee you're going to get an email from the church and you'll get uh, also a letter in the mail they will say the exact same thing we have a handful of folks that aren't on email so we're going to mail those out we'll send an email out as soon as we know our date and uh, in that letter you will have some detailed instructions of of how we're going to plan on making these opportunities safe uh, for you for everyone involved so i want you to be sure and check that out uh, it's an email you want to watch your email this week it's not something that you want to you know, find out three weeks later we sent you an email. So be sure and check your email this week. That would be great. And, um, and also, too, when we do have our date of when we're going to regather together here using social distancing, that, um, that we'll make a, an announcement on Facebook to the public, but it will not be as detailed as what you're going to have in your email. We have a church family that gathers here, and so you're going to get a lot more information that's going to help you know the ins and outs of what we're planning to do. We will have a Facebook announcement that will go out to just the general public to give them a few words as well. Um, and we're hoping that um, if you've been following us online, we hope that you choose to do so in the future as well. We appreciate everyone. Today, uh, if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. The title of today's message is Anyone Can Fall. Anyone Can Fall. Um, you know, you go back over the last number of months, high-profile people in our country that fell. And, uh, you know, sometimes we don't want to name names, but, you know, someone I used to watch growing up, Bill Cosby. I really enjoyed watching Bill Cosby. He fell. Um, had a lot of allegations that came against him uh, of some sexual harassment, things like that. Someone that we all loved, he, he absolutely fell. A little bit later on, we have Matt Lauer from the Today Show fell, come, uh, came to light that he had been making advances on a number of folks, and, and, and he was accused of that, and, and he fell. And uh, we need to pray for anyone that falls. Charlie Rose was another uh, high-profile news anchor. I, I really enjoyed Charlie Rose and his interviews, you know what I mean? And the body of work that he put out is, has been great over the years. However, uh, allegations came out against him, and he fell. And I, not to mention, there's all kinds of people throughout time, high-profile people that all of a sudden, some type of sin got a hold of them, and they fell. This message today is a warning that goes out to me and you that anyone can fall. Anyone can fall. 1 Kings chapter 11, it's interesting that this is chapter 11. When we think of chapter 11, if you're speaking in business terms, chapter 11 bankruptcy, you know what I mean? Think about that. Uh, here it is in 1 Kings chapter 11, Solomon becomes bankrupt in his spiritual life with God. Solomon fell, and that's what we're going to read about today. And as I look here, I find that if we were to read chapter 10, 
of 1 Kings, we would hear of the fame of King Solomon. Uh, his fame grew throughout the world. Um, very popular. He, we would hear of the Queen of Sheba, wealthy queen that came to visit King Solomon. And, and she comes and she visits him and she wants to um, hear of his, she's heard of his wisdom. She wants to hear firsthand uh, how smart King Solomon is. And so she comes and wants to uh, honor King Solomon. So she comes to Jerusalem. She has a great entourage of people with her. Uh, she brings all kinds of wealth and she gives it to King Solomon. Um, she sits and talks with him. She asks him all kinds of questions. And the Bible says in chapter 10, verse 3, that there was not a question too difficult for King Solomon. That when Queen of Sheba, she walks away, she's thinking, my goodness, Solomon has answered every question that I have. And, um, and Solomon was wise. Scripture tells us that. Um, even in verse number past all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And, and you know what? Only, only God truly knows if someone really is wise. Amen. Now, we all think we're wise. I mean, there's been times that my kids have even accused me of thinking that I might have all the answers. Amen. Now, we all think we're a little wise. Only God knows how wise and popular. We're not talking about someone in some corner of the world that he was someone that was notable. We're talking about someone that when he lived, there was no one any wiser than him and no one any richer than him and no one any more powerful than King Solomon in all of the world, earthly speaking, that is. And we're going to read today that he absolutely failed. And listen, at the heart of this message is, is a caution for me and you to not have so much pride in our own personal lives that we would think that we would never do such a thing. That we would never do something that bad. That we would never step over there and do that. That we would never walk over here and do this. We have got to be careful because sin is trying to cause you and I to fall at every turn. I, I mean, we live in a fallen world and this world system that we have wants you and I to embrace every type of sin that comes down the pike. During this uh, shutdown, and I'm going to pick on Netflix for a minute. Uh, during this shutdown, we have, people have binge watched Netflix. Amen. Binge watch that. All kinds of programming. If you've watched Netflix for just one minute or one part of one season that they put out of a TV show, you can tell that they have different requirements on them than normal cable, and it is a slippery slope when you and I turn on Netflix. Uh, the sin of the world is so present in much of their programming, not all of it. I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but much of their programming has that. It tells us where we're at as a country that we're willing to digest a lot of these things. And listen, I'm not just picking on you. I'm picking on me too. We're way too willing to let sin creep around and hang around our lives. Here it is. We find in this scripture here that Solomon fell. Everyone's looking up to him, but he falls. Now, what's unbelievable is that the man that we're going to read about in chapter 11, the man that we're going to read about in chapter 11 wrote the book of Proverbs, and God uses him to pin down these words. Now listen, we're going to read in a minute how this man fell, but I want you to read what he wrote, what God used him to write in Proverbs chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. You want to make a note, that's fine. Listen as I read Proverbs 5, 20 through 23. Well, again, the Holy Spirit breathes these words onto the page of Scripture, but Solomon writes them down. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray." Same man that we're going to read about in chapter 11 that fell wrote those words as the Holy Spirit of God had him pin those down. So we'd say, how in the world could someone write something like that and do what this man did? Or even looking back, how could he do that and have a relationship with God? Friends, anyone can fall. He also wrote Proverbs 6, verse 20 through 24. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. 
it is so unbelievable that this same man that wrote those words is who we're going to read about in 1 Kings chapter 11. Uh, Solomon in chapter 11, we're going to find that he multiplied the number of wives that he had. Uh, he, he multiplied the number of concubines that he had. And he allowed himself to be knocked off of his lofty place of being blessed by God. He allowed himself not just to dabble in sin, but to go headlong in sin. And so again, the title of this message is that anyone can fall. Anyone can fall. Number one, as I'm looking at chapter 11, we see the fall of a king. Look at verse number one. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Verse 3. And he had 700 wives, the princess says, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now remember here, we have Solomon who is the king of all of Israel, and in his day he was also considered the, the greatest king upon the face of the earth. Um, I, I'm telling you, friends, this is one of the perils of leadership is that you get to a place in leadership, the enemy really wants to knock you off. The enemy wants you to fall. And here it is, Solomon's at the top of the food chain. He is uh, this great king. And, and, and he is, he, here it is, he's the supreme civil leader on the planet at the time. We're talking about someone that's in charge. He's well-respected among all the nations. They may not have liked him, but they respected him. He is characterized by his wisdom. He's also char characterized by God's distinct favor that's upon him. It was like people looked at him and thought, you know what? It's just easy to see that God's with him. I assure you this. If, if God is with any of us, if God is with any person, if God is doing anything, anything through a person, the enemy's wanting to knock that person off. He wants them to fall. The enemy does. I look here and I find while Solomon was existing in this lofty place of prestige and honor and he had all this fame, um, King Solomon fell. While all that was going on, he, he fell. He, he continued to be king, but he fell in God's eyes and God's favor left him. And we find that here in this passage as we read today. When I look here and I see the fall of the king, there's a handful of things that contribute to this. First off, we find that Solomon had many wives. Uh, in our passage, it says that Solomon took for himself 700 wives. Now, I could pick on you wives out there, and I'm thinking, I have one wife, amen, that's all I need. He had 700 wives. Um, now, let me tell you, this was rebellion against God's order back in Genesis. Um, God has set forth this order in Genesis where way back in Genesis, he pro provided for Adam a wife, one, singular. From Adam's rib, listen, he took a rib and created a woman. He did not take a bunch of ribs and give him a bunch of wives, amen. So he gave him one wife from, from one rib, and, and that's what God's plan was for Adam. And now listen, if you think about Adam, and he's going to populate the earth, you would think, you know, maybe way back in Adam's day, well, it seemed like it would benefit God if he were to give Adam a whole bunch of wives starting out to populate the earth. No, no, no. He gave him one. He gave him one. One. Jesus even comments on this. In Matthew 19, 15, Jesus said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The two. Now, that's the way Jesus saw it. Of course, he is the living word. That's what Jesus said. But back in Genesis, we have one. And here we have Solomon taking 700 wives. 700. Now, if you go back in Genesis chapter 4, you find Lamech is the first person that becomes a polygamist. Lamech does in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse number 19. And it's, it's against God's will. It's a rebellion against God's order. Um, Moses, whom I love, Moses tolerated polygamy and allowed it to go on in, in and among God's people. Moses did that. Um, Moses also was faced with the, when the people wanted to divorce one another and they come to him and they pressured Moses. 
They had hard hearts. Jesus even said that. They were very hard-hearted. And Moses, due to all the pressure and the people being hard-hearted and them lobbying for divorce, he issued them a certificate of divorce for certain things. Moses did that. That is not God's plan today. Now, listen, I, I get it. There is life after divorce. So if you've been divorced, divorce certainly can be forgiven of, and there is life after divorce. But I'm telling you, God's best plan is for two people, a man and a woman, to come together and become one in his presence and rely upon him, and he would keep them together. Uh, here it is. We have Solomon breaking laws that God put down. And he has seven. He brings 700 wives or takes rather 700 wives. But now the second problem is this. He also takes for himself foreign wives is the second thing. Now, when you take a look at this, at the very heart of this matter here is not so much that these people were from somewhere else. It's that they served other gods. God has always been interested in people being equally yoked. Today, he is still interested in, in a person being equally yoked. Uh, if you're someone and, and you, you're a Christian and you're following the Lord Jesus Christ and you're looking at perhaps getting married one day, God cares about who you marry. He is wanting you to marry someone that serves him. That's what he's looking for you to do. Now, many of you are listening. You say, Brother Jason, you know what? I was a Christian when I got married. My spouse was lost, and through time and over time, they become a Christian. That's great, and that does happen. It does. But if you're out there and you're single and you're thinking about getting married, God does care about who you marry, and he doesn't want you to be unequally yoked. In business, he doesn't want two people to be unequally yoked. You have a Christian business owner and a non-Christian business owner, and they come together and they form a business. They will have competing values. There will have, there'll be problems that will arise because they are unequally yoked. Here it is. We've got Solomon. He brings in all kinds of wives from all these other countries, and guess what? They serve other gods. They serve other gods. And when the, script, the scripture that we've just read, it, we find that they helped influence his heart, and he turned, and he, listen, made concessions. He compromised, and he gave in. And here's the thing. He still worshiped the one true living God, but then he would appease his wives, and he would worship their gods and allow them to worship their gods. Mark it down. There is no room for you and I to worship the one true living God and worship false gods at the same time. There is no room for it in your life or mine. None. And listen, today we've got a lot of little G gods in our lives, and, and we would never say they're as important as our God, but the truth is they may be or they may have been. Right now, perhaps during this shutdown, we've had a lot of things that have inconvenienced us, and it may be, wouldn't you love just to roll back the scroll and understand right now, did God really allow some of our little G false gods to be taken out of their preeminence in our lives? And I've got them just like you. Sports, and I love sports. I've all, I know I don't look athletic all the time, amen, but I've played sports. Let me tell you, it has too much of a high place in all of our lives. Recreation, I love recreation. It has too much of a high place in our lives. As some people I know don't have any recreation. They need to loosen up and have a little fun and go recreate a little bit, amen. But I'm telling you, sometimes we have that way too high at the top of the food chain in our life. It dictates how we make decisions. Some of you that are listening to me, listen, you're a workaholic. I get that. I've been that a lot over my life, too, at times. Let me tell you, some people, they idolize or worship their job or their career. It can get in the wrong place in priorities. It's a little G God, and we're unequally yoked. Next thing you know, it's it, it, that hobby, that thing is dictating what we do and how we live. Here it is. We've got Solomon. He, he has all these women that he marries. He shouldn't do it. And then he's got these foreign women who come in who are worshiping false gods. He makes concessions for them. Hey, listen, he loves them. They're pretty, right? And so he is listening to what they say. I remember when I started dating and started dating and got married. Well, let me tell you something. As a husband, you've got to pay attention to your wife. There's things they want to do, places they want to go. You've got to go those places. Amen. Well, Solomon's no different. But he has 700 and 700 are telling him, hey, listen, we want to we wanna worship our gods. We want to do what we want to do. Solomon, I would have hoped, would have been a great evangelist, amen. He could have turned 700 wives toward God, you know what I mean? But he didn't. He just made room for their gods. Friends, this is a slippery slope, and this contributed to the fall of Solomon. 
that he let that influence him. And listen, who you and I love, they are going to influence us. It's natural. That's the way it is. But when you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have got to love him more than anybody else and allow him to influence us more than anybody else. If we don't, listen, we could fall. We could fall. And here it is. We find Solomon, he fell in marrying all these foreign women. They had a voice into his life in such a way that, you know what, he absolutely fell. Sad. While Solomon was the king, he was accustomed to having anything and everything he wanted. Because his pocketbook could, could pay for it, he, he had everything at his fingertips. He had the ability to make a lot of great decisions, and certainly he made some great decisions. But here it is, we find that he absolutely made the wrong decision in marrying all these women and marrying foreign women. i got to move on. Also, third, looking at the fall of a king. Solomon was likely influenced by his father David and David's sin. And this helped Solomon's sin. David had more than one wife. In fact, David cheated on his wife with Bathsheba. Um, David uh, had committed murder. David had his own problems. David was someone that loved God. Uh, when you check David, though, David did not worship false gods. This is where him and Solomon are different. They both were sinners, amen, and we're all sinners saved by grace. And, and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And some would say, my brother Jason, I don't know, They're, every sin's the same. I tell you what, friends, study the Bible cover to cover, and you're going to find that not all sin is the same. Sin nature is sin nature, but not all sins are the same. The person has some petty theft going on, that's one thing. The person that worships a false god, that's an entirely different category of sin. Solomon sinned in a way that was different than his father. David sinned, but David never turned and worshipped false gods. Solomon did. And there's a difference there. Difference in what happened there. And what you find here that, you know what? We have David sinning. Listen, here's the thing. David, the father of Solomon, he embraces sin. He has more than one wife. He has a few. And then you have his son, Solomon, comes along and really embraces sin and has 700 wives and 300 concubines. And, and here's the issue. Parents, grandparents, listen and hear me well. As parents, whatever we embrace a little bit of, we embrace, let's say we embrace a little bit of sin, we give license to our children and grandchildren over here to fully embrace that sin even more. If we give them an example of sin and we, listen, we paint a picture that it's okay or that you can dabble in it and it might not hurt you, we don't need to be surprised when our kids are walking in it full, full speed ahead. As parents, listen, I hear this all the time. I get tired of it by people. Listen, they'll say, well, you know what, Brother Jason? I, I like alcohol, for instance. Brother Jason, I think a person can socially drink and have a couple of beers. It's not a big deal at all. Do that in front of your kids. You do that in front of your kids. If you paint a picture that a little bit's okay, then talk to me later when your kid's a full-blown alcoholic. They watched you dabble in it, and they go headstrong into it, and they're an alcoholic. Talk to me then about what you think about that sin back there. Tell me about it. The person says, well, you know what? I, I used to dabble in marijuana, so I let my teenager dabble in it. It wasn't a big deal. It's a gateway drug. I don't care who passes the law. Next thing you know, your kid's walking into heroin because you allowed them to smoke marijuana thinking it wasn't that big of a deal. It is a big deal. David had a sin, and it wasn't good either. But Solomon completely embraced it even further. And let me tell you something, friends. It's a slippery slope. Solomon absolutely fell. And his dad was an influence on him. This is scary if you're a parent or a grandparent. We're always influencing our children. <laughs> children, we always are. How we deal with the waitress at the restaurant, how gracious we are to them. Our children are watching. How much we get onto the referee at a basketball game. <laughs> Guilty as charged, amen. Our children watch us do that. Our children listen to us. If our government leaders are doing things that we don't like, or maybe someone down at the school or the courthouse does something we don't like, and we just start talking about them, our children are listening to that. We're all guilty of this. And what we do a little bit of, our children, next thing you know, they'll think, well, you know what, we can just fully do that. Friends, here it is. David dabbled in sin or had his own sins, and, and then here we go. Solomon just takes it to another level. David had many wives. Solomon had very many wives. It's just sad. I look here and I find that, that Solomon fall. He didn't have to fall, but he absolutely failed. So, number one, the fall of a king. I've, I've got to move on. 
Number two, after we see the fall of a king, we also see the progress of evil. So I want you to look further. Look at verse number six. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not full, fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and from Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now, this sin of Solomon here that we're reading about, it was directly against God. God had chosen his father David to rule Israel. As a byproduct of that, Solomon was going to rule Israel. That was God's choice. Absalom did not uh, have the go-ahead from God for him to do that. No, we, we read about that recently. But Solomon was going to be this leader. So God blesses Solomon not only with wisdom and fame and fortune, but he is going to have so much power over his enemies. And, and God had done all these great things for Solomon. And, and this is how Solomon treats God, that he would allow all these, these wives to worship false gods, that he would go on and and build a place of worship for them. And we, we see that. Builds a high place in verse number 7. Solomon is known for building the temple. God even said to David, Hey, David, you're not going to build the temple. I'll let your son build the temple. And so Solomon builds the temple, but at the same time, he is also building high places. Building the high places for this worship of false gods. Um, I look at this, and I find this is a sin directly against God. Now, you and I sin against one another. We can do that, but, but here it is. This sin goes straight against God. And Solomon here, he is blinded by his sin, and, and he steps into major wickedness. If you, if you look at this, this is horrible, horrible. He sins against the one true living God. And just in case someone here today listening thinks that God overreacts, um, that God overreacts to some things to our sin. Let me tell you something. God, God is a jealous God. He does not want to compete with your heart while you worship a false God or I worship some other God. He absolutely is upset with that. He does not want any false God to take our heart. He knows what he did for me and you, how he went to the cross and laid down his life for us. He knows that he is the one that's created it all. And so for his creation to worship anything other than him, yes, he does get jealous. And guess what? There are consequences to sin, consequences for following after false gods. Here we see Solomon. He's building this altar to Molech. Molech was a false god that had the head of a calf, and the arms, um, arms were outstretched, and they would put human sacrifices, their children, they would lay in the arms of Molech, this statue, and they would set those children on fire. Here it is. We have Solomon embracing all of this. It's just, it just blows my mind that someone that had such wisdom would turn to this. Let me tell you something. That's how your heart can turn you against God. People say, well, you know what? If it feels good, do it. No. You better check with the Lord about what, you, what you're feeling. You know, our hearts will lead us astray so often. We need to be careful with that. Our hearts can't always be trusted. And here it is. We have the wisest man at the time, the wisest man on the planet. He becomes a fool. Anyone can fall. Anyone can fall. You got to move on. This evil progresses. So he marries these 700 women, has 300 concubines, and he says, okay, you can worship your false gods, and it progresses. He's like, I'll tell you what, okay, I'll, I'll build a high place for the worship of your false gods, and, and yeah, we'll let those practices continue. So it, it, evil progresses. And by the way, in our world today, evil is progressing. It is in our country, evil is progressing, but it just won't go on. Listen, God, God's paying attention. The third thing today we see in this passage as we read a little further is the anger of God. Verse number 9. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. Let's stop right there. Did you catch that? The Lord had appeared to him twice. Now people today say, well, Brother Jason, if I could just see God. He appeared in some way, shape, or form, Solomon had, I'm talking, he had an amazing experience with the Lord. And he still did this. And you want to tell me that me and you won't fall? you telling me that we're above falling? Now, I'm not preaching this so that you and I can go out with some kind of guilt complex. I'm preaching this so you and I can be aware that playing with sin is dangerous. It's dangerous for me. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous for any of us. That, that it is dangerous. 
that you and I could be someone different down the road. Now, I, won't, I don't believe in a minute for some, that someone can lose their salvation. Let me tell you something. You can go from glorifying God, though, as a, as a Christian, to being a Christian that does not glorify God. Last week, we talked about Lot. Lot was a saved soul, and he lived a lost life. He lived in the most sinful city there was. He did not affect that city at all, at all. But he knew the Lord. So, he, at least I believe he had a saved soul, but I believe he lived a very lost life. A Christian that compromises all the time may be just as saved as the next person, but they may live a life that looks lost to the world because they've embraced everything that's coming down the pike. Solomon was a saved man that all of a sudden he began to live a life that looked very lost because he absolutely caved in on his biblical principles, the very wisdom God's given him. He walks away from it. He compromised. So verse number 9, the Lord had appeared to him twice, verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. Now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king of Edom. This is the inevitable consequence of sin. Solomon painted God in a corner. God had been gracious to him. God had been overly gracious to him. And here it is. God had no choice. There's a, God has a displeasure with Solomon. And the fact that he would come to Solomon and say, hey, listen, you've went way too far. Listen, I don't care how you, you can read that and you can interpret that a number of ways for yourself, but I'll tell you how I interpret that. When God comes to Jason Lowhorn and says, your sin displeases me, he does that from an attitude of love. He loves me. He loves you. He loves us enough that he will not let us keep playing around with sin. That's why even as a saved person, you have conviction of sin. Even as a saved person, you feel convicted about things that you and I do that we know are out of bounds. Some people think, well, that's maybe they never were saved and now they're going to get saved again. No, listen, you get saved once, but even after you're saved, there goes on this conviction. Is if you and I embrace sin, we will feel convicted. Here it is. God said to Solomon, enough is enough, and he absolutely shows his displeasure and allows some consequences. Here it is in Scripture, it says that he raised up an adversary. God, listen, God wasn't just, you know, Solomon, hey, I'm mad at you for what you've done. He's like, I, I, listen, I'm upset with what you've done, and I'm going to bring an enemy, and he's going to clean your clock. Now listen, we're talking about a God who means business. He means business. Listen, this is why I follow him. This is why I can believe that he died for me and rose from the dead. Because he has my best interest at heart. He has your best interest at heart. He is serious against sin. He's also seriously in love. He wants to love on you. He wants to care for me and you. So he doesn't let us get by with these things. I look here, if mankind would just stop and think about some of our actions, you know, and say, is it worth it that I do this thing? Is it worth it? I am thankful over the last couple of years that we have begun to see some congressmen say to themselves, there's no way they can go to Washington, D.C. and vote pro-abortion or be for abortion. There's no way they can do that and know that they're going to stand before their God. I am so thankful we've got more congressmen that know Christ that are saying, you know what, I can't compromise on that. No, I have got to be supportive of, of, of legislation that saves babies. I'm so thankful that in the last couple of years we've seen more come out and say, you know what, I'm going to stand before God one day. They realize it's not worth it to go along with the crowd. It's not. I look at Solomon here. He'd say that we all need to stop and think before we plunge forward into any kind of vice. For Solomon, it was lust. That was his thing. Listen, he may could have wrote books and he may have helped you with, with, with nine out of ten subjects and you and I have been like, man, this guy is sharp as pencil in the box. This guy's amazing. But when it comes down to women and the lust of the flesh, he completely caved in on that. And it's proven that it helped him fall. I, I think about some of those sins. Um, and I know I, I mentioned alcohol earlier. Listen, there are real 
consequences to embracing any vice or any sin. There are real consequences to embracing this stuff. And, and people today just think, well, because they don't see an immediate consequence, they must think that maybe God's okay with it. Can't tell you how many Christians want to talk to me about their casual drinking of alcohol, acting like it's not a big deal. Between who? You and yourself? What does God think about that? That you would intentionally dull your faculties so that you could maybe, maybe take the edge off of life a little bit and feel a little lighter hearted about the circumstances. The person that's for uh, marijuana being sold publicly and it's just something that's legal and it's not a big deal. And it's, it may not be a big deal to you, but, but so your kid could buy that legally someday down the road and be introduced to that. And next thing you know, it doesn't appease them anymore. It used to take the edge off, but now they need something more. And before you know it, they're doing heroin. What do you think about marijuana now? Listen, there are people with such a reprobate mind that they don't even understand that those two things are linked. Because they think this, this is not really a sin, this other is a sin. Really? Really? Friends, I'm telling you, we've got vices. Gambling, for instance, is one of those. Gluttony, absolutely. Somebody will always say, Brother Jason, I, I know you probably could lose a few pounds and you always preach on alcohol. Let me tell you something, friends. I get that. There's all kinds of sins, all kinds of them, that lead to all kinds of devastation, no doubt. We cannot sit there and turn a blind eye to it and act like it's, there's no consequences to it. Consequences to any kind of sin that you and I embrace. For one person, based on their lifestyle, they, their consequence could be, yes, high blood pressure and cholesterol issues, all those things. Yes, absolutely. Another person's consequence may be that they get drunk and drive through a red light and kill another family and spend the rest of their life in jail. That's a consequence. People say, now, aren't those two sins the same, Brother Jason, someone that heavily gets intoxicated and kills a family and then a person that's just a glutton, aren't those the same? You know, they're both sins. Aren't they equal? One of those you're going to pay a bigger consequence for because one of those killed another family. Just telling you, friends, know your Bible. Brother Jason, all these sins are equal. You're wrong on that. You read your Bible, come back and talk to me. You're going to find out that God has different views about certain sins. Listen, sin nature is sin nature. That is the same. Every person born into this world, listen, has born with, we're born with a fallen sin nature that has got to be redeemed. A person's got to be born again if they're going to go to heaven. Every person has that sin nature that must be redeemed. But when it comes to individual sins, the consequences of those sins ranges in all kinds of different, but there's always consequences. And your sin and my sin never just affects us. It affects everybody else around us, whether we think it does or not. I, I look here and I find that you and I can choose to sin. And we can choose to do whatever we want. God gives us a free will. I get that. But here in this passage, what you find is God's permissive will allows Solomon to do every bit of this. God could have said to Solomon, I'm not going to let you take 700 wives. No, God gave him free will. God also gave him the law and the commands of what he knew to be true. You know what I mean? He walks away from that and chooses to walk into sin. Here's the thing. You and I can choose to sin. We can choose whatever we want to do. What we can't choose are the consequences. Solomon fell. Now do you think, do you think that if someone come to him at the beginning and said, these are all the consequences you're going to face if you do any of this, let me tell you something, friends. Sometimes we still choose to sin. Here it is. Solomon fell. He fell. And some would say, Brother Jason, you can make a mountain out of a molehill. Not everybody that drinks a little bit of alcohol is going to become an alcoholic. I get that. I understand that. I I'll tell you a story real quick, though. I knew a fellow one time that uh, was having trouble staying awake, driving home from work. He was in a church I pastored. So if, you, if I've been a pastor of yours for 20 years, you may know who I'm talking about. He's with the Lord now. But this person... Driving home, needed to stay awake, felt like he needed to stay awake, pulled over to a convenience store, began to get these little energy drinks, little five-hour energy, energy drinks. After a while, they didn't help him too much. Someone would say, Brother Jason, those are legal to purchase. I get it, right there at the register. Legal, absolutely. He drank those. It didn't help him anymore. Next thing you know, there were some kind of little seeds that were there at the counter, a little package of seeds, and you could like put those seeds in your mouth, almost like chewing, like dip or something, and he'd put those, in, and they would like stimulate you, and he did those for a while. It kept stair-stepping, and it turned into drugs. The guy was driving home one day, had a taillight out. Police officer pulled him over. 
pulled him over, and began to realize the guy's speech was slurred. Had him get out and did a sobriety test. The man failed it. The man went to jail. I saw him the next day. I was blown away that in about six months, he had went from an energy drink to some kind of drug and was in jail for it. And somebody say, Brother Jason, are you saying energy drinks are all bad? I'll say this. You and I need to be careful with whatever we embrace. I don't care what it is. And it's not sin in moderation is okay. Some will say, well, as long as you do something in moderation, Brother Jason, it's okay. I don't buy into that. That's not in the Bible. That's from the enemy in hell. No sin partially embraced is okay with God at all. At all. So we need to be careful. Anyone can fall. Solomon fell. And I look at this, and listen, I like Solomon. His dad, David, is one of my boys. I love him, amen? He's one of my heroes of the faith. He also killed a man, David did. What that tells me is our God is willing to forgive, and our God is willing to work with us. Our God can take a life that, it, that does uh, make mistakes and, and, and sins. He can take that life and turn it into something that's powerful and can impact a lot of people. But it requires you and I to regularly turn away from sin because anyone can fall. i tell you what I want to end real fast. I, I, listen, you've got to land this airplane, amen? Um, I want, I want you to hear my heart this morning. I love the people of God. I love the church of God, the churches. I love them. And I love our nation. Um, over the last five or six years, I've become probably more patriotic than I've been in a long time. I love our nation. My heart hurts for our nation as well because I don't want to see our nation become something that it's not supposed to be. For our children and grandchildren, I want them to have a, a better experience in this nation than I had. Uh, but I see our nation embracing sin. I see our country winking at sin. Um, and it concerns me. If you look back at the message I just preached this morning and Solomon taking on 700 wives that were foreign wives. I, listen, this is not a political state, but I want you to understand this. Our country faces consequences all the time because our country has relationships with other nations that hate our God. And we act like there's not a problem with that. We act like we can do business with a nation around the world that hates our God and persecutes our church, the church, the Lord's church. They persecute the Lord's church in their nation, and we as a country do business with them because they have a resource that we can uh, obtain for them, goods and services. We get those, and we act like we can have a relationship with a nation that hates our God, and we're going to be okay. I say shame on the United States of America. We cannot keep doing that and expect God to look the other way. I think this is one of the sins of our country right now and has been for a long time. I think we need to repent of that. Does that mean that we don't do business with other nations? I mean, it means this. We have values here in the United States of America, and, and we have a, a, a crowd in this country that acts like this, church, this country was not founded on Christian principles. They're wrong. They're wanting to rewrite history, friends. This nation was founded because, listen, believers came where they could worship God freely. And it wasn't just any God. It was the God of the Bible. And we come here and, and, and we build this nation, God's hands on this nation. All of our patriotic songs talks about how God has blessed us, and he has. We're in jeopardy of falling as a nation when we have these relationships with nations that hate our God. So we have that sin. It's been going on a long time. I don't know if any one presidential administration or one set of Congress, group of Congress can fix all of that. It's a major problem. It's been there a long time. But then you take our country of in-house problems that we have. We have nations that hate our God that would never embrace same-sex marriage, but our country has. We got nations that hate our God, but they, they look at us thinking, what are these Americans doing? They're embracing same-sex marriage. You tell me that's not a big issue with God? It's a huge issue with God. The abortions of this country. And listen, COVID-19 has killed a number of people in our nation, well over 60,000, you're talking about how many people, 66,000, that number is growing, it's slowing down, but it's, it's up there, yes. We've had so many babies aborted in the last two or three months of our nation that eclipses that number. And we want to, listen, we want to honor life. 
I get it. If you're going to honor life and you and I promote that, let's how about all life, amen? Listen, babies in the womb matter. Senior adults that are about to die need to live as long as they need to, amen, as God wants them to. They matter. Everyone in between absolutely matters. But here it is. In our nation, we still have legalized abortion. Let me tell you something, friends. Our country needs to repent. The Bible Belt needs to repent as well. Every, every place in our nation, we can blame certain areas of our country. We're all in this together. We keep saying, oh, I keep hearing that every day we're in this together. You know what? This is also a consequence of living in a nation that sins against the one true living God. There's many believers and Christians living in this nation right now. We're going to face a lot of consequences as believers because we live right here in a country that embraces things that are so sinful and God's anger is aroused by that. Now, what can you and I do? You know, at the end of the day, that's where I get. As a father, as a husband, as a pastor of a church, a community leader, what can I do about these big problems? I'll, I'll tell you what I can do. It starts with me and my household not embracing the sin that's being pushed our way by, by the world, by the media, by our own entertainment desires, it's us saying no to that, us making a choice that we're going to keep these things out of our life personally. We're each going to stand as believers before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm not going to have to give an account for the nation I lived in. I, listen, nations are judged in the here and now. Mark that down. Nations are going to stand before God all together and God say, you guys did this as some kind of congress. No, nations are judged in the here and now, and our history books are filled with, listen, all kinds of incidents and times where God brought judgment down upon our nation. Read through the Old Testament. You find where God did it with Israel over and over again. God's doing that because he loves his people. God's doing that to communicate to them that sin's killing them and they need to not embrace it. So we here living in the United States as Christians, many of us, if we're Christians living here, we're going to face all kinds of consequences because we live in a nation that still legalizes abortion, legalizes same-sex marriage. And by the way, people that have committed, a, listen, uh, paid for an abortion and done an abortion, listen, there's forgiveness for that, please. There's all kinds of bondage related to that issue. If you're someone and you had an abortion a long time ago and you know deep down there's guilt associated, associated with that, call on God and say, God, please forgive me forever. Signing consent to do that. Listen, God will forgive you for that. Forgiveness is available. Available. He so desperately wants to forgive you and I. So come to him. Maybe you're someone and you embrace this same sex type attraction. And you say, oh, Brother Jason, you know what? I've realized now that that was sin and it wasn't just some type of thing I was born with. And I realize it's sin. Listen, you're not too far gone from God. Call on God and say, God, I was wrong on this. And here's the thing. Ask God to change your desires. He can do that. Listen, a person that's born again, that's what they're doing. They're turning their life over to Christ, and he wants to change our desires. So, so maybe you're listening to this today and you said, Brother Jason, you know what? I, I'm embracing some kind of sin right now, and you know what? It's getting out of hand, and, and, and I'm fearful that I can't come back from that. Yeah, you can. You, you sure can. Not alone, though, but you can with God's help. What you call on Jesus Christ? You need his help. Our country needs his help. What you call on Jesus to say, Lord, please forgive me, a sinner. This sin's got a hold of me, and I, it's a slippery slope. I, I look back at this passage right here. Wouldn't it have been great if we could have read that Solomon came to his senses and realized that God was right and that, that he absolutely took those 700 wives and said, listen, I can't be married to all of you, and took those high places and tore them down. And all. Wouldn't it be great if we could read that he did all that, that he repented of that? In the Bible, you have people that, that did make major mistakes and sinned against God, but then they repented. So it's there in the Bible. There's people that repent. You and I need to be one of those people that regularly repents of sin. Why? Because we don't want to suffer through the consequences. There's enough consequences just living in a fallen world. You and I don't need to create consequences by walking against God and walking against His Word. So today, won't you call on the name of Jesus? I don't know about you. I need His help right now more than I did yesterday. What you call on Jesus and say, Lord, please forgive me, a sinner. If you've never been saved, in order to be saved, you've got to believe that Jesus died and rose again. Once you call on Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose from, the dead, rose from the dead. Lord, please forgive me of all my sins and save me, a sinner. If that's you, why don't you call on Jesus today?
Now, it takes God dealing with your heart. Not, a person can't get saved unless the Holy Spirit draws them. But I'll tell you this. During this message and during this last few minutes, you sense there's something going on in your heart and there's a little uneasiness there. Maybe it's this uneasiness of being confronted with this question. Do you know Christ or not? If you sense that, won't you call on Jesus and say, Lord, please forgive me. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. I don't want to live my life for me anymore. I want to live for you. Call on Jesus today. Friends, the warning we had here in this word is that anyone can fall. You caught that at the end that God raised up an adversary, an enemy, from the Edomites. These people would come against God's people throughout the whole Old Testament just about. Somebody said, why in the world did God keep them around? I'll tell you this. The permissive will of God, the sovereignty of God, and the providential plan of God. Listen, there's always a, a, listen, a remnant of the enemy waiting to tear us down. And God sometimes, in his permissive will, allows them so that you and I could realize how wrong we've been. So maybe the ball's not bouncing your way and you feel like God has come against you or that it just seems like nothing's going right for you. That could be the hand of God so that he allows you to get to a place where you'll call on him. Why don't you call on him today and say, Lord, I need you. Folks, it's been good having you tune in here to uh, Salem Baptist Church. We're glad to have you online. We're excited that you chose to tune in today. If this message has blessed you, I'm not going to ask you to send in an offering. That's what TV evangelists do, amen? I'm not going to do that, but I am going to ask you to share that with someone. Do you have someone in your life that needs to know Jesus Christ? Someone in your life that maybe they're walking down some slippery slope? Uh, someone that needs to hear what this message shares? Listen, hit the share button. Share that with your friends. And uh, folks, be tuned. We'll hopefully be making a decision about when we're going to regather and not, not reopen. We've been open for a while. I mean, we've still been worshiping. We've still had ministries going on. But when are we going to regather together? Be listening for that. We'll get that word out to you soon. Folks, we love you here at Salem Baptist Church. Uh, tune in again. Thanks.